coming up on One Central Florida. These warriors on water paddle Central Florida lakes in their battle against a deadly foe. Then, life in Apopka, a journey through Orange County's second largest city. Also, an Orlando sculptor uses his experience on the stage to create art that is classical and comical. And restoring the past is a gas for this business in Coco. All that and more on this edition of One Central Florida. In 2000, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had a mastectomy. And then in 2008, uh, I had uh, a lumpectomy in my left breast and with radiation as well. In um, 2006, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a uh, mastectomy. These women share something they'd rather not have in common. Each has survived breast cancer. Now they have another shared experience. They're members of a Dragon Boat team, one of countless such groups around the world. Like many, Justine was new to competitive sports when she began paddling. I was never a gal that was in sports. I was never in a team sport of any kind. First time I went out on the boat, I thought I would die because uh, I'd never experienced such a workout and being on the water with 19 other women and trying to keep up with them was incredible, incredibly hard. Oh. First time on the boat, I could barely do five paddles, five strokes, and I'd have to wait a few minutes and then start paddling again. I have challenged myself more than I ever thought I could. I can paddle the whole practice now without stopping and having to, to take a breath. So it has increased my activity. My upper body is much stronger. That hard work has paid off. We have been to quite a few races throughout the state of Florida. We've gotten medals for coming in first and second place. So yeah, that's really exciting. When I see those awards, I'm so proud. I'm so proud that I have actually been in a race and have actually survived a race because our motto on our boat is you can do anything for two minutes. Oh, good job. Oh, you did great. Make the sisters through and through. Hardware is nice, but for these women, dragon boating is about much more than trophies. I have many connections, all different kinds of connections, and um, our, our team is so diverse. The camaraderie I have is quite amazing. And those are the kind of people that, they're, they're all strong women. And I feel very empowered to be around them. We know each other and support each other because we know what each other's been through. Everybody has their own unique individual journey and story, but we have that common bond. We understand what breast cancer can do to you as an individual, to your family, to your work, to your life to your fears, to your hopes, we understand. You feeling good? Yeah, feel great. Yeah. That sense of shared purpose also helps these paddlers face what can be an uncertain future. It's everybody wanting to give back, trying to continue to live their lives the best they can after the diagnosis. Being part of this Dragon Boat team has changed my life. I, I've met lifelong friends, and I feel empowered and spiritual with them because this is a club not everyone should be part of, but when you are part of it, it empowers you. I feel a camaraderie and a, and a sisterhood that I would have never felt before.
The Apopka area dates back to about 1600 or so. Indian tribes lived along Lake Apopka. The army comes here to drive out the Seminole Indians, move them further south, and with them comes a federal law encouraging settlement. So the first settlers come around 1840s and begin to settle here. Settlement in Apopka was anchored by a building that still stands today, the Lodge. This is an amazing building. It's the oldest continuously occupied building in central Florida, built right before the Civil War by the Masons. The Masons occupied the second floor, and the first floor has been a combination school and jail and government offices and church through the early history of Apopka. The original name of the town was The Lodge because of the early building being here. The Lodge becomes the largest city in Orange County. It was a commercial center, it was a social center, and uh, for a time it looked like it would become the county seat. It's not until 1882 that the city council votes to officially make the name Apopka. The word Apopka dates from the early Indians. They grew potatoes along Lake Apopka, which then was one of the most beautiful lakes in Florida. And Apopka is really two words that means potato eaters. Apopka today is the second largest city in Orange County. Its history, from a citrus and indoor foliage center to the sprawling suburban city it has become, is the life stories of its citizens. Now 95 years old, Belle Gilliam moved to Apopka in 1923 where her father worked in the orange groves. She married into a citrus family also. His grandfather had uh, been in the grove caretaking business since the, uh, the, er the late 1800s. So he was brought up in an orange grove also. My husband and I, after we got married in 1946, his father sold us the Gillum Grove Service. The Grove Service consisted of planting trees, uh, watering them, fertilizing them, and spraying them, and dusting them. Her fond memories of Apopka always revolve around the people. We were a, a close community. Everybody knew each other. There was about three or four families that were considered wealthy, but you know, most of the people in Apopka were rather poor, but yet we didn't know it. We were rich with love and affection. These days, she spends a lot of time at the town's historical museum. I volunteer at the Museum of the Apopkins because I love history in the museum, and Apopka has got so much to be proud of. Michael Gladden Jr.'s Apopka story also begins in the 1920s. His father ran an important general store. Michael Gladden Jr. became a very, very prominent figure after his father's death in 1924. Took the reign of operating the general store. And not only just was it a general store, but it served as a meeting place. The black people of the community trusted Mr. Gladden. He was a community leader. He never delved into politics per se, but he was more or less an advisor. Uh, he was, it was nothing for him to go to the mayor and say, you know, what was needed or what should be done in the community. Michael Gladden served his community in many ways. After he died in 1982, a main street in Apopka was named in his honor. Today, the community built by citizens like Michael Gladden and Belle Gilliam is growing rapidly, which has meant a lot of changes. There's not the closeness that we always had. And, and I do miss that. I welcome the growth, but at the same time, I like to preserve the history so that our young people will know who was here before and the contributions they made. Coming up on One Central Florida, creating classic art from clay to bronze, an Orlando artist shares his inspirations. Also, a company in Coco that makes a business out of living in the past.
Cameron Carlisle is a 17-year-old from Lady Lake who saw firsthand on a mission trip to Ghana the poor hospital conditions expecting mothers endured. There was a path a woman had to take. It's rickety, it's outdoors, not covered. If it's raining or the middle of the night, they have to go on it. I was floored. I thought, how is this happening? How has nobody done anything about this? And I thought it was something I needed to take care of. Cameron utilized Facebook and crowdfunding websites to raise $16,000 for a new maternity ward. My friends donated at my birthday parties. We had random villagers giving checks in the mail, which was amazing, seeing the community really come together. Recently, Cameron returned to Ghana to see the result of her two-year effort. It's an entire building where women can be before they have their child, after they have their child, basically any kind of maternity situation. It's new, it's beautiful, and the women there love it. And Cameron isn't done trying to help. Right now I'm raising money to get the first incubator for the hospital in the region. I cannot tell you how much this experience has changed my life. I don't think I was going down the right path, but this definitely had took me back and made me change who I am. And I think I'm a pretty good person, not just from doing that, but who it made me become. Cameron Carlisle, One to Know in Central Florida. My name is Jack Hill, and I'm a sculptor. I was a mime, magician, and ventriloquist. I was fortunate enough to study with Marcel Marceau in France. When I was performing in mime, I'd go through a series of movements, and as a sculptor, I had to take that whole series and select one moment and sculpt the one moment to tell that entire story. Well, a lot of my work is classical. And that influence, I guess, comes from the fact that my greatest appreciation is Michelangelo, Augusto Rodin, uh, Botticelli. They're the best. Who better to study from? And I find it thrilling and also challenging because sculpting a human figure is probably the most difficult, most challenging thing that you can tackle as an artist because we've all got a body, we're all familiar with it, we all know what it looks like. But rather than reproducing it exactly as I sculpt it, you can exaggerate, you can change things, you can make things a little different than what they really are. In 20 years of sculpting, nothing finished the way I anticipated it when I first started. There's always that little serendipity element in there. For example, I'll be putting some clay on, building the sculpture of a face. Maybe it's a face I'm just making up from having seen a dozen people that day. And I don't know exactly where I'm going. I put a piece of clay there and go, oh my gosh, that makes that eye express something fabulous. Or I could put too much clay on and say, oh my gosh, that nose is horrible. I have to take some off and redo it. And of course, that's the wonderful thing with clay. Take it off, put it on, keep going. And that moment, where something exciting happens that you had not really anticipated. It's, it's wonderful, it's thrilling. That's the creative process. You keep sculpting and modeling until you've got the finished piece. Once the piece is finished, then the technical process starts. You make a rubber mold from that. Into the rubber mold, you pour wax. And hopefully we'll get it all in one piece as I extract the wax from the mold. And this, believe it or not, is a very thin wax reproduction of the original sculpture that we saw just a moment ago. This is what, after I do some cleanup touches, will get sent to the foundry, and they will, using the lost wax process, cast it in bronze. And three to four months from now, I'll get that bronze back here to my studio and then go ahead and clean up the metal and put the color on it, which is called the patina process. All bronze is done through that process. Most sculptors do not make their own molds. They do the piece in clay, 
and they very seldom see it again until they go and sign it. I like to have more hands-on because I have worked at a foundry, so I've got a lot of those backgrounds and experiences. And sometimes there's even an opportunity in that process to make some changes. I can look at a piece and remember what was going on in my life at the time that uh, it was created. As a matter of fact, there's several pieces like that. I have a mermaid piece that I was doing very early in my sculpting career, and it involved a mermaid swimming towards the bottom, dragging a sailor behind her, obviously to his death. And what was going on in my love life at the time very much reflected that piece of sculpture. <laughs> These are all my children. They're people that I've imagined and created as I started sculpting. And those that have not yet gone to the art shows to uh, get sold, I get to live with. Past chaos is not what you think it is. Um, what we do is we restore old gas pumps and service station related items. At least that's the way it started back about 25 years ago. It is an antique store. We do sell everything that's here in the showroom. Uh, all the restored items are restored right here on the premises. And again, we do everything from gas pumps and gas station memorabilia to uh, scales, penny scales, soda machines. Uh, we do bumper cars. We do the entire cycle. We pick it, we paint it, we polish it, and we have to pedal it. I mean, we could spend four or five hours on a, on a small piece and get it ready, um, or we could spend 80 or 100 hours on a piece, just in-house hours. There's never only just one project going on. We're always working on three or four, or at least three or four things at a time. Our products go all over the world, and our customers are usually restaurants, decorating, um, theme parks, movie companies. Largest endeavor back in 1989, we dressed three complete gas stations in a diner for a movie called Coupe de Ville. I mean, I get customers that come in and um, you know with their with their kids, and they don't know half of what. You know, what they're seeing here. I mean, for instance, I mean, we sell these old driving speakers. People don't even know what they are. Um, what I'm trying to do is show them, uh, in my own way, what it was like back then, how things were made. Uh, everything was made with pride. Um, everything was made here in the U.S., uh, was bought here in the U.S., and um, you, just, you just don't have that now. The name Past Gas came, I don't know exactly when, but it was way back in the early time when I, when I first was starting to do all the restorations. And I guess I was sitting on the john one day and it just came to me. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the way it, <laughs> way it happened. But uh, I guarantee you one thing, once you hear it, you'll never forget it.